Thank you for auditing. Always positive. New Music Review Show, hosted by a French professor who's had kind of a tough time lately. Now, if you know anything about what I've been going through, my dad passed on Saturday. Before that, he was in the hospital. So I've been in and out of the hospital. I've had family members. I have not had the time to do my channel. And this is not my full-time job. This is a hobby that I picked up in the lobby. And I love it. I love doing this channel. Um, but it's it's a lot of work. It really is a lot of work. And I've had to put it to the back burner. But the thing is, like, I have like an itch, you know, like I need to make these videos. I need, I need to make content, as as I could say in the most crass way. I really need to create. This is my creative outlet. So I'm trying to think like, how can I do this? You know, because the problem with, with having a, a life catastrophe is that you then have to put your work on the back burner. And then when you can put the work back on the front burner, you have to put everything else on the back burner. I'm still catching up with things from two weeks ago. I have 183 unread messages, which I should be looking at now instead of doing this video, but I'm not. So what I'm trying to do now is I'm trying to combine a couple of things. So I'm going to show you a class. So I'm teaching a class on hip hop music and hip hop culture and rap music. It's going very well, but it's very time intensive. It takes me three to four hours for each 50 minute class that I teach. Okay. I just have to create new PowerPoints. I have to find readings. I have to create questions. I have to figure out how am I going to teach it? I have to think about the timing, the space, the quotes, the animated slides, all that mess. So it's a huge, huge undertaking. Every single class that I teach. And, uh, but you know, this is my music channel. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to share with you a class that I taught a couple weeks ago. And uh, this is also going to serve the function of helping my students who weren't there. So, hey, um, you could be one of my students, one of my actual students, not my auditors. So if you're one of my actual students, you're welcome. Here is the class on uh, everything leading up to Rapper's Delight. And uh, if you're not in my class, you're just auditing this channel, stick around, you're going to learn what my students learn about the road to Rapper's Delight. So how pretty, how does that look? Does that look good? Oh, I don't know how that looks. We'll have to see. Like, am I in the screen? Am I next to the screen? I don't know. I, I never really know what, uh, what it's going to look like when I record Zoom. So we'll just hope this looks good. So this is my idea, Road to Rapper's Delight. How did we get to a hip hop, a hippie to the hippie to the hip hip hop and you don't stop, did dang, okay? How did we get to the first commercially successful rap song in 1979? Now listen, I've already provided videos on this channel and I've already talked to my class about how did hip hop begin, okay? That's a whole nother question. We're talking Bronx in the 70s. We're talking Jamaican sound systems and break beats and DJs. But the question for today's class, or for today's video, a uh, class from last week, whatever, the 30th of January, is how did we get to these three guys becoming the first national names in rap music? So um, if you've been watching this channel, you've seen what I've said about DJs. So this is going to be a question that I am going to ask my students. If you cannot answer this question, A, you don't understand the history of hip hop, and B, you're not going to pass the midterm. How did DJ Cool Herc, Grandmaster Flash, and Africa Bambata invent hip hop? Be sure to mention the innovations that they brought. Hey, are you at home? Do you, do you want to comment? You comment, okay? You tell me in the comments. Do you know the answer to these things? If not, read the comments because someone's going to tell you. If not, go back and watch my video where I talk about the rise of the DJs. Okay, I'll include a link to it or just find it. It's in this creating a hip hop class playlist that I have. So let's talk about rap. Okay, um, currently uh, Lupe Fiasco is teaching a class at MIT, and uh, I remember I had like a little interview. Whatever he, I was able to interview him for a few questions. someday I'll, I'll share the audio of that. And I remember that he was very insistent that he is not interested in teaching hip hop. He's interested in teaching rap. And that he generally considers rap to have started in 1979 and not really respecting the, well, not acknowledging the 1973 attribution of the creation of rap music because it wasn't rap, right? It was part of this hip hop culture. I totally respect his opinion. And I think it's a, a totally valid, you know, first of all, who am I to say he's valid? He's, he's a lyrical genius and a master of, of uh, hip hop culture. And martial arts, not just some dude sitting in his living room. But uh, I, I totally see his perspective, and I, I agree with it uh, to a certain extent. But still, uh, I think it's more important to teach 
if possible, the full context of hip hop. But what we're really going to get into now, what's going to dominate the rest of this class isn't really hip hop. Okay, there is a class that I just taught on. I've done two classes on graffiti. I've done one class on uh, hip hop dance. I'm going to do another later in the semester when I can figure it out. But really, most of it's going to be about rap. So this is the question, like, where does rap come from? Modern rapping come from? How do we get to rapper's delight? Well, I always start with etymology. That's my favorite thing to study. Uh, people often ask me, what book should I get? I say, get Chambers Dictionary of Etymology. Spend time with it. See where words come from. See what they mean. Okay, so where does the word rap even come from? You can also go to the online etymology dictionary. It's quite strong. Talk informally, chat in an easy way, 1929, popularized 1965 in African-American vernacular, okay? So going back to the 60s in Black American speech, all right? That's how far back it goes, at least. Possibly first in Caribbean English and from British slang rap to say utter, okay? So <laughs> as a noun in the sense, I mean, to perform rap music is recorded in 1979. So we're getting into Rapper's Delight, right? How do we actually get to Rapper's Delight? So what I'm, I'm going to do now is I'm going to pro provide sort of a, a prehistory of some of the African and African-American traditions that lead to the idea of speaking as creation, not reciting poetry, but speaking in a competitive, rhythmic, and meaningful way, okay? If there's anything I could sort of, if I could sort of use three uh, adjectives, creative, rhythmic and competitive i think that really are the things that that dominate rapping right so 1965 i forgot that i uh oh wait no, I i'm gonna do i'm gonna i'm gonna use my clicker as a professor i have uh i have one of these clickers and it's uh, it also has a laser pointer but i hate laser pointers um, i always feel like i'm going blind every time i use one these clickers make me feel like a real, oh wait, I can't, I don't have a space for it. All right, fine. I'll just keep clicking the thing. I'm still not gonna edit this video though. So you're just gonna have to sit there. So I'm gonna kind of start with a couple things. And I'm gonna start with music and poetry that predated rap. And I'm gonna talk about oral traditions, okay? Very often, I want to say a couple things about sort of African American and African oral traditions and rap music. This is not settled science. Some scholars think that it's overstated that the African origins of rap music are overstated. Some think they're understated. I'm just going to provide some ideas and I'm not going to give you a conclusion. If you're one of my students, I expect you to be able to repeat these things to me because I personally believe that there is a connection, but I want to make sure that you understand this is not a straight line that we can be hundred percent sure of. Now, of course, if history was just, uh, if, if the relationship between Africa and African-Americans were not forcibly uh, murderously divided and, and severed, uh, by slave masters, then we would have a more clear answer. But as it is now, we have to allow for the murkiness of history. So often people will say that the, the roots of rap music go to something called the dozens, or as they are now known more often, mama jokes. I'm not going to get into the feminist and classist implications of mama jokes. That is very interesting. I suggest. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe ask me to do it, but I'm, there might be a YouTube video out there that talks about it because it is it is very problematic. As a feminist uh, and as someone who is not for the wealth gap, uh, mama jokes are, are quite complicated. But the origin doesn't go just to mamas. It is just the idea of competitive insults. Okay, your mama's so poor, your family ate cereal with a fork to save milk. I just found some examples I thought were funny. Your mom's so poor, she tried to ride a, rob a bum. But of course, it's not always. The dozens is not just about your mom. Sometimes it's also about you. You're so stupid, you sold your car for gas. <laughs> That's very funny. Uh, your mom was so ugly when she joined the ugly contest. They said, sorry, but no professionals, you know? And what's interesting about the dozens and what I like about it and you know, I played these all the time with my friends. I didn't understand that I was taking part in a tradition that went back centuries. I thought I was just doing something that I heard on a King T album, 
King T is a West Coast rapper, the number one influence on Notorious B.I.G., one of the most overlooked rappers with probably my favorite rap album of all time, Act a Fool from 19, I believe, 89. But he has an entire song that's just mama jokes, you know? And as a white suburban kid, I, we all did mama jokes. We didn't understand that they came from some place. Now, eventually I learned that it came from African-Americans and that's what I generally accepted. And the crucial idea is this, it's the creativity and the competitiveness, okay? That's what really matters. I love sports radio, okay? I listen to Boston sports radio. I listen to French sports radio talk about my favorite soccer team. I listen to sports radio all the time. And the reason I listen to sports radio is that human intelligence is general. There is no group of people that are more intelligent than any other. There are just groups of people who have more access to education than others. Okay. So as a humanist, I love finding places where people are smart and intelligent and are not necessarily there because of the privileges of education. That's why sports radio is great. You can listen to some guy with a Boston accent. I don't know if uh, he really should have uh, pitched them up there. You can't, uh, you know, you really can't uh, get lefties out. You know, like you can have these really deep, complicated concepts, sometimes spiritual, sometimes just technical about the Boston Red Sox without an education. And I think jokes like these are that same kind of idea. Humor is as Henry Bergson, the great French philosopher, tells us a, uh, an expression of intelligence, right? That's why humor is interesting. You can't be funny and not smart, okay? You can be smart and not funny, but you cannot be funny and not smart, okay? Because it requires a high level of intelligence. So these mama jokes, even though they are just insulting your mom, whatever, each of these has a different layer of funny and has a different layer of intelligence. And so if we actually think about what the dozens are, if we accept the general concept that they were uh, popularized by groups of African-American people in the early 20th century, it's the definition of people who did not have access to education, okay? They did not have access to higher levels of education. So how are they going to show their genius? They're going to show their human genius in many different ways, and this is one way. This is human genius. No professionals, that is a genius joke. Okay. But what I found interesting is uh, if you don't know hometown history, home team history, excuse me, uh, it's a very good uh, YouTube channel, um, much bigger than my channel. So good for them. It talks a lot about the relationship between Africa and African Americans and world culture. It's very good. And they have this great video about the African origin of the dozens. And this is what, oh, uh oh, sorry. PowerPoint failure. Uh, and this is what I discovered from watching their video on the dozens. They make the claim that it comes from Western Africa, which makes sense that a lot of African-American culture would come from Western Africa for the sad reason that it was easier to get slaves from there. They were closer, ge geographically closer. No trains, no planes, okay? So, so much of African-American history culture, you know, going back centuries, is tied into these Western tribes such as the Igbo, who played this game, Ikocha Nakocha, which was a post-dinner ritual between youths. And what is interesting home team history emphasizes is they were non-personal insults here, meaning that you would, if somebody had uh, big ears, you would not insult them for having big ears. You would insult them for being stupid, okay? Like you don't actually hit below the belt. That was the idea. Between family and friends, more importantly, it creates bonds between family and friends. It becomes a community question. And this is what is so great. Whenever I would play the dozens with my friends, it would be because we were friends. I would make fun of them because they were friends. I just spent a week with all three of my brothers. I, we very rarely get together all together. And even in our a massive grief, we're constantly capping on each other. That's an old term that means making fun of. It's nothing to do with truth or not truth. We're constantly dissing each other, constantly making jokes. We're sparring, we're showing off, we're competing, but it's also a sign of intimacy because I won't talk that way to a stranger, okay? I, I won't do it. Importantly, in this case, it was one-on-one. -on -one. You see, it's one-on-one, -on -one, but in front of an audience. And that's part of what makes it so important, you know? Uh, somewhere I told a story about when I got fascinated by uh, insulting people with no audience, 
you know? So I was with my, my girlfriend and her brother and I started like insulting their mom and it was, you know, there's no one there to laugh. So it was just basically social suicide. I was a jerk. I was an edgelord before the term, you know, you need an audience. That's what's necessary. And this is why, why am I talking about this in relationship to rap? Because it is this competitiveness and this creativeness and this community, but then also it's in front of an audience. You can't just sit alone in a room and insult each other. You need a third, fourth, fifth person. Rarely was it sexual with the Igbos. Rarely was it about family. Again, non-personal. But this is what I love. Oops, sorry, I got my chairs here. I'm going to keep kicking them, making incidental noises. Other parts of Africa used personal insults, like lower down in Ghana, um, and attacks on family. So I think we sort of see both of those in modern hip hop. Again, home team history, I'll include a link to it in the comments, it's a great video. But the term rap, as we saw, also existed in 1965. You know, so like, as a term of informally talking, that exists. Now, Isaac Hayes, if you don't know anything about me, Isaac Hayes is one of my top five favorite musicians of all time. Just, I love Isaac Hayes so, so much. <laughs> Such a great, influential, meaningful, American, super genius, not just a genius, an American super genius. He should be on a stamp. We should take his birthday. James Brown and Isaac Hayes, we should have at least a bank holiday for each of them, regardless of their personal foibles. And we have a day off for Washington and the do note slaves, okay? Um, so like this idea of rapping was often heard in his music and he has a song off of the amazing album from 1971 black moses and i have to tell you something this is the point in class where i press play and we listen i can't do that i'm going to be putting this video on youtube when you put videos on youtube and you have music there's these little things called the copyright goblins you go, <laughs> there's these little cyber goblins internet cyber goblins who scan through all of your stuff and find that you have something that belongs to WEA Publishing or Island Def Jam Publishing or whatever it is. And not only do they take all of your money, which I don't care about the money, this video is not going to make much money, if any money at all, cents on the dollar, cents on the hour, cents on the life, um, but it'll stop it from being viewed. Because if you play two things from two different, they, they cancel it and block it in every country everywhere. The good thing is you're sitting there and you're watching YouTube. Either you're my student, in which case you must do what I'm asking you to do, or you're my auditor and I suggest you do what I want, what I'm asking you to do. Okay, so look up the song Ike's Rap 2 off of Isaac Hayes and you can hear him talking. I know you hear me, been a long time. I guess you got the last laugh. I know I abused you. I took advantage of you. I used you selfishly. So he's just talking and he's talking on record. And this was not done hardly ever before. And certainly not while it's called rap. If you happen to be listening to this song and you recognize it, it's because Portis Head, a super important British electronic, I don't even know. I guess we call them Chip Hop, an, another great band, one of the best bands of the 90s. They sampled this album extensively, including this song for the song Glory Box. Glory Box is the song that goes, I'm so tired. De -doom. It's just a straight sample. But that's music. It's also important to put hip rap in the context of African-American speakers and poets of the 60s and 70s, okay? We're getting to hip hop, the hippie to the hippie to the hip hip hop and you don't stop, we're getting there. The chicken will taste like wood, I promise, but we're not there yet. I could spend an hour going over all of the precursors to modern rap music and the sense of creatively speaking with rhythm and a sense of competitiveness. And as we will see also a sense of social justice, which we'll get into soon. But let's talk about this guy, H. Rap Brown, somebody I discovered through rap music. Mock Hami quoted him and I found his book, his book, the title, which I am not going to say, okay? Uh, his book, which came out in 1969, 10 years before Rapper's Delight. We are getting to Rapper's Delight. Okay. You'll notice that H. Rap Brown, his middle name is not actually rap. It's Geroid, which is like, what a name. Geroid. I had Geroids once. I'd have them removed. Uh, so the, he has the word rap in his, in his name. And we'll see why. It's because he was called a rapper. 
1969, four years before Africa Bambaataa invented the breakbeat, 10 years before the term rap was popularized. A little small thing here, if you study American history and African-American history, this guy is in jail. Uh, he changed his name uh, when he converted to Islam, so he really should be called Jamil Abdullah Al-Amin. You should just read the story about how this all went down. Tons of irregularities. It's 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 crazy. And you're like, oh, is this stuff still happening? Yes, this stuff is still happening. The the war on civil rights is still happening, but this is not a criminal justice podcast. So if we look at this book, we see how he contextualizes all these things I just said. He talks about the dozens. He talks about how the dozens informed him, how it was an expression of his intelligence. I learned how to, I'm quoting the book now, I learned how to talk in the street. We exercised our minds by playing the dozens. I effed your mama till she went blind. Her breath smells bad, but she sure can grind. In many ways, though, dozens is a mean game because what you try to do is totally destroy somebody else with words. It's that whole competition thing again. What is rap music? Using words to destroy somebody, okay? This is a concept. Destruction, terror, and mayhem. Show me his so so sucker, I'll slay him. Farmers, what? Okay. Uh, that's I haven't taught my class that song, so you know what I'm talking about. And he says, that's why they called me rap because I could rap, I could talk. He also emphasized the idea of signifying, which is kind of similar, but the way that he describes signifying, signifying is one of these words which defies dictionary definition. It is used differently by different people at different times. And me, I'm just gonna be straight up honest. Me being a white dude who did not grow up in any of these material circumstances with any of this culture, will never fully understand what the word signifying is or what it means. I am admitting my ignorance here, okay? You can tell me in the comments if you feel you have a good understanding of what would be a good quick definition of signifying, but I have found it as a word that escapes singular definition, which therefore makes it one of the great words, okay? Well, any word that escapes singular definition is a great word. Other words in that category, cool and funky, okay? Signifying is more humane. Instead of coming down on somebody's mother, you come down on them. But before you can signify, you have to be able to rap. So signifying is also sort of like talking about how great you are and how bad they are. And a lot of these themes that we're going to get into with rap music are different variations of signifying. We're going to be talking about sucker, MC, sucker MCs later, and we might say that that's in a similar round of signifying. Okay, You have to be able to rap. Here are some of his raps. They call me rap, the dicker, the ass kicker, the cherry picker, the city slicker, the titty licker. And I ain't giving up nothing but bubble gum and hard times and I'm fresh out of bubble gum. Hey, remember when you all thought that came from the movie They Live by John Carpenter and it was Kurt Russell? Was it Roddy Piper? Whatever it was, Kurt Russell, Roddy Piper? Whoever it was in They Live who takes off his glasses and says, I'm here to kick ass and chew gum and I'm all out of gum. Guess what? Once again, it's another thing that came from African-Americans. Walked 49 miles in barbed wire, used a cobra snake for a necktie, got a brand new house on the roadside, made from a cracker's hide. Yes, I'm hemp the demp, the women's pimp. The women fight for my delight. Do you hear the rhythm in that? You hear the rhythm and the rhymes in here? Hemp the demp, the women's pimp. Women fight for my delight. Fight delight, that's an internal rhyme. Pimp the demp, that's an internal rhyme. Demp and pimp, that's an internal rhyme right? It has a certain rhythm to it. You could almost put it into like a hip hop song. I'm hemp the dimp, the ladies pimp, the women fight for my delight. You could almost say, you could almost hear that. You can almost hear the rhythm in some of these lines, even in, in the rhymes. Walked 49 miles of barbed wire and used cobra safe for necktie. Got a brand new house on roadside made from a cracker's hide. This is all rhyming. This is rhyming. This is rhythmic. This is competitive. And this is signifying. As he also says, signifying was also a way of signifying your feelings. So this is talking about the emotional capacity for rapping, rapping in the terms that he's using. H. Rap Brown, Mr. Alamin, okay? Free H. Rap, free Alamin. This is a, I don't, I haven't studied the case enough. Maybe he shouldn't. Maybe he really did do the thing that they said he did. I don't know. I, I have a hard time trusting the U.S. government when it comes to jailing uh black dissidents 
The track record is not good, but I'm not, I don't know. I don't know. I'm staying out of that. Um, I mean, I'm staying out of it because I just said it, but I will say my official stance is I don't know, but I'm suspicious. Signifying at its best can be heard when brothers are exchanging tales. So here he is, and he's talking about the ability to express yourself through rapping, through talking, and the way he describes it, talking in a creative way. Hey, what's the most watched television broadcast in American history? Do you know this? I asked this of my students. None of them got it right. None. Now, I gave them a hint. I, so this is two through eight of the most viewed broadcasts in human history. Super Bowl, what is that, 59? One of the good ones. TB12, you know. Do so, you know what's number one? Is it a different Super Bowl? Do you know this? Tell me in the comments if you know it before I tell you. Did you have you smashed the like bucket? Students, you don't have to smash the like bucket. You don't have to, but auditors, I'd like you to. This is confusing. Hey, it was the moon landing. 125 to 150 million people watched the moon landing when the population was about 200 million people. That's more than half the people on in the country were watching the moon landing. And how great was it, everybody? Yay, we landed on the moon. Yay, we made all this progress. Yay, we looked into the stars and we decided to conquer it. And then John F. Kennedy said we were going to, and then we funded it through NASA and then through all the great work of all the scientists and thinkers and brave pilots and, oh, constructors. Yay, we did it. Yay, we landed on the moon. 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 Who's we? Who's we? Who are we? What were we doing? How much did it cost? What was going on? What was happening when we landed on the moon? Who is we landing on the moon? Okay, who is we? Oh, what a great, big, wonderful thing that's happened when we walked on the moon. The same time that we walked on the moon, the American ghetto was on fire. The wealth gap was growing. The injustices were growing. Slum lords were rising. The Bronx was in its descent. The inner cities across the whole country were in descent. We had our eyes on the moon. And meanwhile, we, meaning the white upper class and bourgeoisie who controlled the country, were looking at the moon and ignoring what was in our own cities, what was in our own states, what was in our own country. So not only can we talk about precursors to rap being precursors to like the early days of, you know, rapping and saying cool stuff and dissing and all that, but also there are these precursors who are able to represent the political side of rap music as well, such as Gil Scott Heron and his very famous piece, poem, Whitey on the Moon. You must find this if you're in my class. You must find this if you are in my class and listen to it. I'm probably going to play this on the midterm. You're probably going to have to be able to identify it. It is from 1970 and it is talking about that ambiguity I'm talking about. Yay, we landed on the moon. But who is we? What, what does landing on the moon, what does a white man in a, um, in a, white supremacist society landing on the moon do for somebody who is living in a urban hellscape of benign neglect. That's what Gil Scott Heron was able to do. So I'm going to, Jesus Christ, I'm sorry, uh, golly gee, I'm going to, I play this for my students and I play it off of YouTube, but I can't do that because I don't want the copyright goblins. We've already discussed the copyright goblins. So that means you're going to have to hear me <laughs> with my very not Gil Scott Heron voice without the bongos. So the, the, there's several recordings of this. A very good one has bongos underneath and it just sounds like rap before rap. It, that's just how it sounds. It's rhyming. It's creative and it is politically conscious and is trying to make a statement while being rhythmic speaking. 
Okay, these are all the things that are leading up to rap. I'm just going to read that. I'm not going to try to read it with like cosmic gumbo. Okay, I'm just going to read it straight. A rat done bit my sister Nell with Whitey on the moon. Her face and arms began to swell and Whitey's on the moon. I can't pay no doctor bills, but Whitey's on the moon. 10 years from now, I'll be paying still while Whitey's on the moon. The man just upped my rent last night because Whitey's on the moon. No hot water, no toilets, no lights, but Whitey's on the moon. I wonder why he's up at me because Whitey's on the moon. I was already giving him 50 a week with Whitey on the moon. Tax is taking my whole damn check. Junkies making me a nervous wreck. The price of food is going up. And as if all that crap wasn't enough, a rat done bit my sister Nell with Whitey on the moon. This section in particular, I think, is very clearly heard in the development of rap music, especially when we get to 1982 with the message, taxes taking my whole damn check. Junkies making me a nervous wreck. It feels very much like sort of early conscious rap music. It's very, very good. Right? We even see how it changes from the, the, the cadence and the rhythm changes from the rest of the, it's not a song. It's not a song from the rest of the poem. Her face and arms began to swell, but Whitey's on the moon with all that money I made last year for Whitey on the moon. How come I ain't got no money here? Hmm, Whitey's on the moon. Y'all know I've just about had my fill of Whitey on the moon. I think I'll send these doctor bills airmail special to... Whitey on the moon. He waits <laughs> in the recording. He waits to say the last Whitey on the moon. And you hear a person in the audience go, Whitey's on the moon. Like, because she gets so excited. It's such a well created, such a well conceived, such a well put together poem. And it says everything. So, and in case you want to know what the actual voice sounds like, if you're a Kanye fan, uh, who will survive in America? That's Gil Scott Heron. But aren't you glad I didn't read the whole, <laughs> the whole verse of me trying to imitate that? Um, but, you know, fortunately, we're done with that stuff. You know, we don't, <laughs> these kinds of problems don't exist anymore. We don't have symbols of the, of the class divide and white supremacy shoving their space race down our face every single second of every single day. We're not still having the same weighty on the moon problem. Just for fun. Just for fun, I thought, well, well, Whitey's on the moon. Let's talk about Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos, who both want to be Whitey on the moon. Even if the moon is Mars, Whitey's on the Mars. Doesn't matter what it is, okay? Let's just for fun, imagine that we give Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos, let them keep $1,000 million, okay? So they each get to keep one thousand. So they have one million dollars, which is one thousand thousand dollars. One thousand dollars is one thousand dollars. One million is one thousand thousand. One billion is one thousand million dollars. If we let them keep the rest, and if they gave away the rest of that money, if they gave away the rest of that money, they could give every person in the country living below the poverty line over ten thousand dollars. But no big deal. If Bezos only kept one billion, he could give every Amazon employee a hundred thousand dollar bonus, which means every time you see that little car driving up with a little smiley face delivering you your thing, that person could get a hundred thousand dollar bonus. Him and every single person working in every single supply center across the country and in the world, actually, that's the, the global thing. Every single Amazon employee could get a hundred thousand dollar bonus and he could still keep a billion dollars, but Whitey's on the moon. Musk could give every one of his employees a $2.4 million bonus, but Whitey is on the moon. Whitey is on the moon. Whitey is on Mars. Okay. It's all the conditions are still there. So with all of that said, I don't even know how long I've been talking here. We haven't even gotten to Rapper's Delight yet. We haven't even gotten to hip hop yet, but I wanted to give you that context. Okay. This is where we're going. Where do we start? I think we can start with the Igbo. I think we can start with Africa. I think we can start with these oral traditions of competitive word games. I think we can then infuse those with some conscious civil rights speaking and the concept of rapping in African-American English. And that all comes together with Coke Larock, who was kind of the first MC. Give the man his flowers, but don't give him too many, okay? He's sort of the first MC in hip-hop history. I'll explain how, okay? He worked with DJ Cool Herc. If you watch my video about DJs, you know DJ Cool Herc was the guy who figured out breaks, had the first parties ever considered the beginning of hip-hop. And the thing is, when you're a DJ, you also have a microphone. That's just part of it, right? It, it's 
carrying on the tradition from Jamaica. There's a microphone, but DJs can't always talk at the same time as they're doing what they're doing. So you need someone to talk. So he was the guy who talked, okay? He was also a small-time drug dealer. He talks about selling drugs at the same time as he's doing this. And what we see is a progression. And this is what Kochlerock did. He helped this progression go from announcements. Hey, there's a, a blue Chevy Nova that's blocking uh, a red uh, Caprice and uh, you need to move it. Uh, hey, uh, so your mom's coming to pick you up after the show. Hey, the show's going to end in 10 minutes, okay? It started off with that, it started off with announcements. That's what you use the microphone for during the party. And then eventually you grab the mic and you just can't help it. If you're a showman, a showwoman, you just start saying, okay, uh, you, uh, the party's going to end in an hour. And if, you, if you're having a good time, say, hey. Oh. oh, if you're having a good time, say, hey, hey. <laughs> hey this, this is kind of fun. Uh, okay. So it went from announcements to crowd work crowd work to rhymes because rhymes get the crowd excited they get excited with anticipation it feels intentional so you start saying things that rhyme rudimentary things that rhyme here we have the beginning of rap music because those rhymes will eventually become rap but not with coco rock he didn't start doing it he didn't start putting together verses and choruses and songs and coordinating with Kurt Herc what he's going to say. He would just hotel, motel, holiday in. Like he'd do stuff like that, which is great. It's super important. I'm not dismissing what he did, but don't confuse it with the first rapper. But he was an MC. But the important thing was he was not the star. And a lot of hip hop, and I'm going to be crediting uh, E. Woodsy's book, um, who I'm going to be showing you soon. A lot of the early days of hip hop and rap, the thing to understand is where the focus is. Because the thing is, we're talking about people who come from nothing and who have nothing. So acquiring money is not just some thing, it's a necessity. And so where the attention is, is where the money is. And we see that rap and hip hop, the attention keeps shifting and focusing. And in these early days, Coke LaRock would not be the star. Okay, you look at the flyers from the time, and it's always DJ Cool Herc and Coke Rock. Sometimes Coke Rock wouldn't even be mentioned. Okay. But that would change because, as my students will remember, please remember this students, when Grandmaster Flash centralized the attention on the DJ, the MC would also get more attention. So Grandmaster Flash realized how to mix things more smoothly. His protege, Grand Wizard Theodore, invented scratching, which made DJing also more spectacular. It made it more of a sport. It made it more of an attraction. All of a sudden, DJ Cool Horse parties, where he was the star, but he was the star because the music was so good. It made the people dance. It was a communal thing of everyone sort of looking at each other, not staring up at one centralized point. Grandmaster Flash was so successful at, at being a DJ that he thought he failed because people stopped dancing and started watching him. When people stopped watching, when people started watching and stopped dancing, that is when hip hop started to move from a collective experience towards a singular performance, okay? So Grandmaster Flash in a lot of ways ushered in this whole idea that going to a hip hop show is about standing and looking and watching someone on the stage, which works out for them because that means more money. If you have people staring at you, it means that you matter more than the stuff you're playing. It means that you have a value, a monetary value. But yes, and this is, that's the book I was talking about. In a previous video, I said that it was good. I wasn't sure if it was necessary for a hip hop library. I was totally wrong. <laughs> the more that I read this book, the more I realize this is probably the second or third best book ever written about rap music. This guy is awesome. Just awesome. It's a great, great, great book. My entire class is two levels deeper because of this book. That's how good it is. It's awesome. So let's talk about Cowboy. You know, I think we're, we're moving towards, because we're not even at Rapper's Delight. I think I've been talking for an hour. How long have I been talking? I've been talking for a while. Cowboy, as one of the Furious Five, the first MC that Grandmaster Flash would really have central. He literally fought 
to join Flash. He broke some dude's jaw. He got into a fist fight to grab the mic. Rap is a competitive art. Hip hop is a competitive art. The competition is part of it. It is not a flaw. It is part of it. I don't know how many times I need to say it, but it, that, I just keep saying it. My poor students, I just say it over and over again. Hip hop is a competitive art. Hip hop is a competitive art. It's important because we tend to dismiss competitiveness as not being artistic. And that's why I emphasize its importance. If it's a part of the art, then it's not a fault. He invented the term hip hop. He was talking about someone who was going to go into the army and he sort of laughed and said he had to march and said hip hop, hippity hop, hip hop, hippity hop. And then someone sort of heard that and he would integrate that into his rhymes. And then people started calling the music hip hop in a derisive fashion, the same way that the term impressionism was used to insult the kind of art that Claude Monet invented um, with uh, his painting of Le Havre in 18... Uh, 71? When was that painting? Doesn't matter. And just listen. It's Black History Month, which is obscene because Black history is American history. It's just it's, the, the idea that we would have to carve out any time when the American history is so... American history just is Black history. And I mean, and white history, you know, but it's, it's just the idea that it would have to be carved out is just crazy. Anyways... Everyone should know that somebody had to be the first person to say, throw your hands in the air and wave them like you just don't care. And his name is Cowboy. Okay? Just respect the man who came up with that term. The most pop, probably the most said sentence in the history of performance, besides thank you, was throw your hands in the air and wave them like you just don't care. And along with the other members of the Furious Five, he invented the modern MC. He, along with the other members of the Furious Five, such as Melly Mel, who we'll be talking about in the next video, were very centered on creating verses, creating songs, not just saying repetitive rhyming things, but creating something to where they could be at the center. This is how Africa Bambata would get the Soul Sonic Force, who would join along with him while he was DJing, and they would rap. This is how other crews like the Cold Crush Brothers or the Funky 4 Plus 1 would start to have these whole teams of MCs who would get together. We're still not a rapper's delight, though. We're talking in the 70s. We're talking 73, 74, 75, 76, 78. This is before Rapper's Delight comes in and changes the whole thing, changes everything, totally changes everything. Now, just for fun, I am imploring you to find out what rap sound like before Rapper's Delight. There is a bootleg tape that you can find on YouTube of Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Four at that point in 1978, December 23rd in the Audubon Ballroom. Astute historians will know that Audubon Ballroom is also the location of the assassination of Malcolm X. History writes itself, everybody. What can you do? Uh, what you will hear is a lot of people rapping, but the DJ is still very central. The songs are very fluid. There's a lot of kind of silly repetition. December 23rd, December 23rd, like they kept on saying the date. And uh, you sort of hear the sort of naivete, the joy of it. And this is it, you know, right before 1979, when rap music is going to be destroyed and created by Sylvia Robinson, the father of rap. I have this joke, this running joke in my class, where I basically say that everything uh, is the father of rap. Everyone is the father of rap. Well, we could say she's the mother of rap, much like the other three founders of hip hop music. She comes from the Caribbean. Her family comes from the Caribbean. Hip hop is very much a Caribbean art. Rap music is very, very Caribbean. It would not exist without Caribbean immigrants, Jamaica, Barbados, Virgin Islands. So that's Sylvia Robinson. And she was already a popular singer. Baby, ooh, my sweet baby, ooh, my sweet baby, ooh, you're the one. Love is Strange. It's a great song. You've heard it in a thousand soundtracks. That's her singing it. I suggest you find it. It's beautiful. It's even more beautiful than me singing it. But she starts a record label. Again, when we talk about people who should be on stamps, Sylvia Robinson is a famous singer who also happened to popularize rap music in America. She attended a party in Harlem and discovers hip hop. 
And she decides, well, if there's no album, does it really exist? So she wants to make the first rap album. And no one says yes. Lovebug Starsky, now who's mostly famous for being name-checked by uh, Notorious B.I.G., Lovebug Starsky, maybe the most important of the early prehistory rappers, maybe the best. It's hard to tell because we don't have a lot of material that he actually recorded at the time. Lovebug Starsky, who was probably the number one rap, 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 rapper out there, regardless of the DJ. She says, I'd like to make an album. And he says, no. Why does he say no? Money. There's no money in records. You can't make money on rap records. What's the point? It's a waste of time. Everyone makes money doing these awesome shows. That's how you make money. He didn't have the vision. She had the vision. So she puts together a group of randos. That's literally how rap music became popular. When I say randos, I mean crispy crust pizza in Englewood, New Jersey. You can go there. It's still open. I haven't been yet. I'm going to visit my nephew and I'm going to go to that, that uh, pizza place someday soon. Crispy Crust Pizza is the place where rap music started in a way. She goes in and she sees this guy, Big Bang Hank, and he's flipping pizzas and he is rapping. He's rapping with a cassette tape that he has because Big Bang Hank is a manager for one of the Cold Crush brothers, Grandmaster Kaz. Side note, Grandmaster Kaz was the first person to sell tapes of performances. So in a way, he was the first person to figure out how to make money with rap recordings. Okay. Another guy who should be on a stamp. Jeez, what are we doing with all of our stamps? All these flowers and flags and eagles. No one watches AOL Blast. Just absolute first guy to sell tapes of his performances. But the... He has as his manager, Big Bank Hank. So Big Bank Hank is sitting there rapping Grandmaster Kaz's verses. Sylvia Robinson hears him and she says, hey, would you like to be in a rap group? What should he have said? Oh, <laughs> I would love to, but actually you've been hearing me perform the works of Grandmaster Kaz. I'm his manager. You should sign him. He's like, what? He takes it. As, as we know, as you will learn, he takes the verse, he uses that verse, that's his audition, he raps someone else's verse, and he gets into the group. According to legend, two people walk by the car where he was doing this uh, audition, and they say they also rap, and thus is born Rapper's Delight, and the band, the Sugar Hill Gang. Rapper's Delight, the first time hip-hop was killed. Not the last time. Hip-hop keeps getting killed over and over and over again. I think hip-hop was killed this, this year already. Yeah, hip-hop keeps getting killed. But this is the first time hip-hop was killed. Now, what do I mean by that? Hip-hop was killed in the name of rap. And it's a question of money. If we think of hip-hop as a culture, okay? Culture exists next to, but not within money, okay? Money is not a determining factor in the creation of culture. I mean, people can make culture to make money, but it's not like money cannot make culture, right? You can make money off of culture. So when hip hop culture was created, it was not created expressly as a money-making venture. And especially with graffiti and dancing and emceeing and DJing and performances, it was a sort of collective movement in the most impoverished part of America in the South Bronx in the 70s. And it was, that's what the hip hop culture was. When Rapper's Delight came out and it made money, it killed that. What happened instead was rap. With this, the word rap is cemented. You saw that in an etymological dictionary. With this, the term rapper is cemented and rap for the first time becomes commercialized. This kind of rap style, disco rap style, what I consider to be usually the Sugar Hill style is, per, is presented live musicians covering a disco song. So even though it's the exact same sound as Good Times by Chic, there were musicians playing that song there. It's a really good song, especially thanks to the, the, the um, is it Bernie Edwards is the bass player, the original bass player on uh, for Chic, this great bass line. And it's also really long, which makes sense Disco songs are long because you have to have a long time to dance to them. That's why all these early rap songs are like seven minutes, eight minutes, nine minutes, 15 minutes. 
And importantly, it includes a verse about eating bad food at a friend's house, includes a verse about Superman's sperm. It has all sorts of things. Now, this is what I ask my students. What do you think? I give them a second. You tell me. You tell me in the comments, unless you're my student, in which case you don't have to. But if you're not one of my students, you are compelled to tell me. What do you think of the song Rapper's Delight? Do you enjoy it? What do you like about it? Does it sound new? Does it sound old? Does it sound timeless? What, what emotions does it elicit? At the 23 second mark, which is where I'd like you to skip to when you listen to the song, we get to this part. I said a hip hop, the hippie to the hippie to the hip hip hop, and you don't stop the rock to the bang bang. Say, say I've drunk the boogie to the rhythm of the boogie, the beat. I want to emphasize this last line. Okay, now, first of all, uh, this, the, this member who is doing this verse was actually almost out of the Sugar Hill Gang until he started saying this hip, hip, hoppy bit. But the rhythm of the boogie, the beat, this is what I really want to emphasize, the importance of rappers to like. I want you, when you're at home, to say it. To the rhythm to, of the boogie, the beat. To the rhythm of the boogie, the beat. Just in those words, much like him, the dim, the ladies, pimp, the women fight for my delight, the H-Rap Brown, this is rapping. This has rhythm to it. It rhymes, yes, sort of, right? But what it really does, or this, actually this rhyme doesn't rhyme, but like it creates this rhythm. It does the thing that rap music is going to do. It takes, and I discussed this in the, in the video I did on rhymes, it matches the cadence of speech and conforms it to the rhythms of music to the rhythm of the boogie, the beat. It is absurdity to the rhythm of the boogie, the beat. It is a shock. People hear this and they go, why is this person saying hippie, hippie, hoppy, hip hop, hip hop, don't stop rock, bang, bang, boogie, up, down to the boogie, rhythm, the boogie, the beat. It's amazing. It's amazing. And it's a rhythmic thing. Of course, it goes back to whatever. I mean, little Richard with tutti frutti, womp, bamba, lu, bamba, womp, sham, boom, right? Like that's also a similar idea of playing around with these words, but here it's not song. It's just spoken. Now, what you hear is not a test. I'm rapping to the beat and me, the groove, and my friends are going to try to move your feet. See, I am Wonder Mike. I'd like to say hello to the, to the black, the white, the red, the brown, the purple, and yellow. This also shows the fact this is trying to be an inclusive song. This is trying to be for everybody. This is a art. <laughs> they are using the art of hip hop and rap music within hip hop that is a very black and puerto rican culture from the south bronx it is at this point primarily located in the south bronx primarily practitioned by african americans to a lesser extent puerto rican americans who are in ewoodsy's book goes into detail about how they got marginalized in the hip-hop culture it's very interesting but um, of course, it was also in Harlem, it was also in Brooklyn. It's not that it was only in that one borough, but this was trying to make it big and move your feet and say hello, and it's for all races. So I think this is the thesis statement. This is what would end up making it uh, such a powerful song, such a big hit. It's taking all of these traditions of rap, and it's taking all of the hip hop, and it's all of a sudden taking it and it's putting it on wax and it's making it for everybody. Now, uh, the, the most told story about this is this verse from Big Bang Hank, uh, where he literally says that his name is Casanova Fly, which is Grandmaster Kaz's synonym. Um, so he's like plagiarizing so much that he says someone else's name. But still, this is. According to legend, either he stole this verse or Grandmaster Kaz gave it to him. I don't know what. But the important thing is he's not a real rapper. He's a, he's a pizza flipper and he is a manager. And he's a plagiarist. So um, anyways, it is interesting though too here. We have this kind of signifying or this sort of bragging about having a color TV so you can watch the Knicks and checkbooks and credit cards and money. We see very early on these kinds of themes. He also has the line later, I'm imp the dimp, the ladies pimp, the women fight for my delight. So H-Rap Brown, he's now plagiarizing H-Rap Brown. And uh, later on in the song, he says, whatever you do in your lifetime, never let an MC steal your rhyme. Jeez, Big Bang Hank. 
And then uh, I end the class by just going over this verse about going over to a friend's house and the food just ain't no good. Macaroni soggy, the peas are mushed and the chicken tastes like wood. As just an example of how long the song was, how playful it was, how silly it was. And what I'm going to do next, this is a two-part video. I don't know what I'm going to do the next part, so hang tight. This, it's a silly song. It's serious because it represents a very serious cultural moment and a very, a very serious um, cultural movement. Um, but it's a silly song. It's partly about super sperm and partly about, about, uh, about chicken tasting like wood. So for we just had the road to rapper's delight. What I want to do then is the road to the message. What happened in early hip hop between 1979 when uh, Sugar Hill Gang is released and 1982's The Message? How do we get from there to there? I've already taken us from the shores of the Ivory Coast, okay, all the way to Sugar Hill, New Jersey. I do need to say one thing. The most important, one of the most important things about Rapper's Delight was the reaction in the Bronx because everybody was like, who the hell are these guys? Where do they come from? Why are they here? What, what, why are they, why is New Jersey? Why is New Jersey taking the credit for rap music, Sugar Hill? New Jersey, an art that comes from New York and New Jersey takes the credit. Can you believe the pain that must have caused? <laughs> the, the pride that must have been injured? So we're going to see between 1979 and 1982, everyone's going to start signing to Sugar Hill Records. Everyone's going to start making music. And all of a sudden, the hip hop, the live culture is going to slowly morph into the rap culture that we have today. Was this a good video? I don't know. I was able to not grieve while making it. So it works for that. Until next time, there's the camera.